Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 7 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is properties of estimators and model selection criterion. In the last lecture we have discussed the multiple linear regression model. We have also discussed the estimation procedures for estimating the parameters of the model. For estimating the regression parameters, we make use of OLS procedure. Now, in this lecture, we will discuss different distributional properties of the estimators like unbiasedness, the probability distribution of the estimator, etcetera. We will also consider the analysis of variance for the multiple regression model. Now, this analysis of variance actually helps you to judge the performance or explanatory power of the model. Then uh, we will discuss some of the testing procedures like uh, testing the significance of the entire regression or testing the significance of a particular regression coefficient. And then we will consider some of the model selection criterion such as a Kaike information criterion, Bayesian information criterion, Malus, CP, etc. At last, we will discuss an example which has been solved using our software. Now, first we consider the estimation of disturbance variance sigma square u. Apart from the regression parameters, we are also interested in estimating the variance of the disturbance term. Now, suppose you write V equal to y minus z alpha hat transpose y minus z alpha hat. And as we discussed in the last lecture, we may write y minus z alpha hat transpose y minus z alpha hat as y transpose m y, where m is equal to i n minus z, z transpose z inverse z transpose. In fact, m is an idempotent matrix, so that m square is equal to m. Then we also observe that v is equal to y transpose y minus alpha hat transpose z transpose z alpha hat. In fact, you can write v as v equal to y transpose y minus y transpose z alpha hat minus alpha hat transpose z transpose y plus alpha hat transpose z transpose z alpha hat. And then we use the normal equation z transpose z alpha hat equal to z transpose y. So, you can write this z transpose z alpha hat as z transpose y. So, this v is equal to uh, so which is equal to y transpose y minus y transpose z alpha hat and then you can write alpha hat transpose z transpose y as say y transpose z alpha hat and plus alpha hat transpose z transpose z alpha hat is equal to z transpose y or you can write it as y transpose z alpha hat. So, ultimately you get y transpose y minus y transpose z alpha hat. You can also write it as y transpose y minus alpha hat transpose z transpose y. 
all in this form. Now, we show that an unbiased estimator of sigma square u is s square equal to v upon n minus k, where k is equal to r plus 1. To prove this result, we write e equal to y minus z alpha hat equal to m y. We just substitute the value of alpha hat and then you can write e in this form. And this e is actually the OLS residual vector. Again, m is a symmetric idempotent matrix and m z is equal to 0. Actually, m is equal to i n minus z, z transpose z inverse, z transpose. And if you post multiply it by z, then you get 0. So, E equal to m y and then this is equal to m u because if you substitute y equal to z alpha plus u and then m y is equal to m z alpha plus m u, m z is equal to 0. So, m y is equal to m u. E transpose E is equal to u transpose m u and this is equal to v. Further trace of m, remember m is an idempotent matrix and it has rank n minus k. So, trace of m is also n minus k. Then if you take expectation, we obtain expectation of v equal to expectation of u transpose m u and then we write u transpose m u equal to trace of u u transpose m and then we take expectation. So, expectation of u transpose m u is equal to trace of expectation of u u transpose m. Expectation of u u transpose is equal to sigma square u i n m and then you can take this sigma square u outside the trace and then you get trace of m here. Trace of m is equal to n minus k. So, you get sigma square u n minus k. So, if we divide v by n minus k which is equal to say s square, then this is an unbiased estimator of sigma square u. Then the estimator alpha hat is an unbiased estimator of alpha and the variance coherence matrix of alpha hat is given by expectation of alpha hat minus alpha alpha hat minus alpha transpose is equal to sigma square u z transpose z inverse. To prove this result, we write alpha hat equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose y and then we substitute y equal to z alpha plus u. So, ultimately you obtain you get z transpose z inverse z transpose z alpha. So, you, you obtain alpha here plus z transpose z inverse z transpose u. So, alpha hat minus alpha is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose u. And if we take expectation of alpha hat minus alpha, this expectation is equal to 0 because expectation of u is 0. Now, this proves that alpha hat is an unbiased estimator of alpha. Further, to obtain the variance covariance matrix of alpha hat, we take expectation of alpha hat minus alpha, alpha hat minus alpha transpose and then alpha hat minus alpha is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose u and its transpose is u transpose z, z transpose z inverse and then we take expectation. So, you get expectation of u, u transpose here. And then we substitute expectation of u u transpose equal to sigma square u i n. So, you get z transpose z inverse z transpose z, z transpose z inverse and then outside you get sigma square 
u. So, finally, expression for the valence covalence matrix is sigma square u z transpose z inverse because z transpose z inverse z transpose z is identity matrix. In fact, uh, alpha hat is the best linear unbiased estimator. Notice that the expression for alpha hat is z transpose z inverse z transpose y and you can write it as C y where C is the matrix z transpose z inverse z transpose. So, alpha hat is a linear function of y. So, that is why it is called the linear estimator and then it is unbiased also. So, it is linear unbiased estimator. Then uh, of course, I have not proved the blue property of alpha hat here, but it can be verified that in the class of linear unbiased estimators, alpha hat is the best in the sense that it has minimum variance. Now, if we assume that u follows a normal distribution with mean vector 0 and variance covariance matrix sigma square u i n, then alpha hat follows normal distribution with mean vector alpha and variance covariance matrix sigma square u z transpose z inverse and v equal to e transpose e upon sigma square u follows chi square distribution with n minus k degrees of freedoms. Here k is equal to r plus 1. Further, alpha hat and v are independently distributed. Now, first we obtain the distribution of alpha hat. For that purpose, we write alpha hat equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose y and then this is equal to alpha plus c times u, where c is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose. Now, since u follows normal 0 sigma square u i n, c u follows normal 0 sigma square u c c transpose. Further, c c transpose, the expression for c is this. So, c c transpose is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose, then we take transpose of this. So, you get z z transpose z inverse. So, finally, we get z transpose z inverse here. So, c c transpose is z transpose z inverse. Therefore, alpha hat follows a normal distribution with mean vector alpha and variance covariance matrix sigma square u z transpose z inverse. Further, E transpose E is equal to U transpose M U, where U M is an idempotent matrix. Rank of M is equal to trace of M, which is equal to n minus k. So, n minus k eigenvalues of M are 1 and remaining k eigenvalues are 0. Further, suppose uh, P is an orthogonal matrix such that P transpose M P is equal to diagonal 1 1 1 0 0 0. So, N minus K diagonal elements are 1 and remaining K elements are 0 and we write it equal to capital lambda. Now, suppose W is equal to 1 upon sigma U P transpose U then W follows normal 0 I N because the mean of W is 0 and the variance covariance matrix is 1 upon sigma u p transpose expectation of u u transpose p and then you have 1 upon sigma square u here. Expectation of u u transpose is equal to sigma square u i n p and since p is an orthogonal matrix. So, you can write it as you take sigma square u outside. So, this will cancel out you get p transpose p here and p transpose p is i n. So, you get this variance covariance matrix for w. So, w 1 w 2 so on w n are 
identically independently distributed standard normal random variables. Then v equal to 1 upon sigma square u, u transpose m u is equal to w transpose lambda w. You just write m equal to p lambda p transpose here. So, you get v equal to w transpose lambda w and notice that the first n minus k diagonal elements of lambda are 1 and all other diagonal elements are 0. So, you obtain summation j equal to 1 to n minus k w j square here and each of these w j's is a standard normal variate. So, ultimately the distribution of v is chi square distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom. Further, if you take expectation of alpha hat minus alpha m u transpose, then this is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose u and transpose of m u is u transpose m and then we take expectation of this term which is equal to sigma square u i n. We take sigma square u outside. So, here you obtain z transpose m which is equal to 0. So, this expectation is equal to 0. Therefore, alpha hat and m u are uncorrelated and uh, both alpha hat and m u follow normal distribution. And uh, in the last lecture, we have discussed that if there are two random vectors following normal distribution and uh, the covariance between the element of first random vector and the element of second random vector is 0 for all elements of first and second random vectors, then both the random vectors are independent of each other or independently distributed. Therefore, alpha hat and m u are independently distributed. Now, v is equal to sigma square u minus 2 u transpose m u and you can write it as sigma square u minus 2 m u transpose m u. So, this is a function of m u and since alpha hat is distributed independently of m u, it is also distributed independently of v. Now, we consider the fitted values say y hat is equal to y 1 hat, y 2 hat, so on y n hat. Now, your model is y equal to z alpha plus u. Then the fitted value of y is obtained as you replace this alpha by alpha hat and then we substitute the value of alpha hat. So, this is equal to z z transpose z inverse z transpose y and then we write h equal to z z transpose z inverse z transpose. So, that y hat is equal to h y. Now, this h is called the hat matrix and since m is equal to i n minus z z transpose z inverse z transpose. So, you can write m equal to i n minus h and notice that both h and m are symmetric and idempotent matrices. Further, if you take h i n minus h, this is equal to 0 because ultimately this is equal to h minus h square and h square is equal to h. So, you get h minus h which is equal to 0. Further, if you post multiply h by z, then you obtain z because z, z transpose z inverse z transpose and then you are post multiplying it by z. So, you ultimately get z and i n minus h z is equal to 0. Then variance of y hat given x is equal to y hat is h y. So, h times the variance covariance matrix of y h transpose and variance covariance matrix of y is sigma square u i n. So, what you get here h sigma square u i n h transpose. 
So, this is equal to sigma square u h h transpose h is symmetric idempotent. So, you get sigma square u h square and h square is equal to h. So, variance of y hat given x is sigma square u h. Now, suppose h i j is the i jth component of h the head matrix. Then you can write the i th component of y head or i th element of y head as y i head equal to h i 1 y 1 plus h i 2 y 2 so on plus h i j y j plus so on plus h i n y n. So, you get this expression for the predicted value of y i. Now, from this expression we observe that h i j gives you the amount of leverage or the impact of y j exerted on y i head. So, this is the impact which y j has exerted on y i head. Head matrix H is used to identify high leverage points, which points have high leverage on the predicted value of y i. If you take summation of H i i, where H i i is the ith diagonal element of H, then summation i equal to 1 to n H i i is same as trace of H and trace of H is equal to trace of z, z transpose z inverse z transpose which is equal to trace of z transpose z inverse z transpose z which is trace of i k which is k. So, summation i equal to 1 to n h i i is equal to k. Also notice that each of h i i lies between 0 and 1. Now, average leverage magnitude is k by n, n is the total number of observations and summation h i i is equal to k. So, total leverage is k. So, then you can say that average leverage is k by n and suppose there is a point for which h i i is greater than 2 k by n, then it is called the high leverage point. So, using the hat matrix you can observe the high leverage points. Now, we can write y equal to beta naught hat l n plus x beta hat plus e. So, a y is equal to now notice that a l n is equal to 0. So, this is a x beta hat plus a e. Then y transpose a y can be written as a y transpose a y because A is an idempotent matrix. Actually, expression for A is I n minus 1 by n L n L n transpose. Then, we write A y equal to A x beta hat plus E transpose and then you have this A y here. So, A x beta hat plus E here. Then, you got beta hat transpose x transpose a transpose a is equal to a x beta hat plus e transpose e the cross product term vanishes because say you take e transpose a x beta hat then this is equal to 0. You just substitute the value of e here and then you will observe that actually a e is equal to 
E. So, you get E transpose x beta hat here and uh, E is equal to m u. So, you get u transpose m x beta hat here and m x is equal to 0. So, that is why the cross product term vanishes. So, you get this expression. Now, what is y transpose a y? You can write y transpose a y as say a y transpose a y and this is equal to y c transpose y c, where y c is the y vector taken as deviation from mean. So, this is equal to summation j equal to 1 to n y j minus y bar whole square. Now, this is the total sum of squares and it has degrees of freedoms n minus 1 because it has uh, n components involved in it, but there is a restriction summation j equal to 1 to n y j minus y bar is equal to 0. So, the degrees of freedoms is n minus 1. Then this term beta hat transpose x transpose a x beta hat. This is called the explained sum of squares and its degree of freedom is k minus 1 which is equal to r and e transpose e which is equal to y minus z alpha hat transpose y minus z alpha hat. This is the residual sum of squares and its degree of freedom is n minus k and from here you can write the total sum of square equal to explained sum of square plus residual sum of square. So, these sum of squares are additive and corresponding degrees of freedoms are also additive because here you have n minus 1 and n minus k plus k minus 1 is equal to n minus 1. So, you can write these sum of squares in this tabular form. And if you divide the sum of squares by the corresponding degree of freedom, you divide explained sum of squares by the corresponding degree of freedom, then you get mean explained sum of square. And when we divide the residual sum of square by the corresponding degree of freedom, you get the mean residual sum of squares. And in analysis of variance, the ratio of these two, the mean explained sum of square and mean residual sum of square is called the f ratio. Now, in practice after fitting the model, you also want to judge how good a regression model is. Now, one of the major is error sum of squares. If the error sum of squares is small and explained sum of square is large, then we say that the model is good, good in the sense that its explanatory power is good, means the explanatory variables x 1, x 2, x r are able to explain the variations in output variable y these are your input variables and this is your output variable. And if the model has good explanatory power, that is if the error sum of square is small and explained sum of square is large, then we say that the model has good explanatory power that is these variables are able to explain y properly. Now, we consider r square which is defined as explained sum of square divided by the total sum of square. And since total sum of square is equal to E s s plus R s s, you can write it as 1 minus R s s upon T s s. This R square is called the coefficient of determination or a square of multiple correlation coefficient. So, this R square gives the proportion of variation in the dependent variable that is explained by the independent variables. This is the variation which has been explained by the input variables or independent variables. 
through the model. And this is the total variation in y's. So, out of this total variation, this part is explained by the model and this part remains unexplained. So, when we say that the model is good, when your model is able to explain most of the total variation present in y s. So, r square actually lies between 0 and 1 obviously, because total sum of squares is always greater than or equal to explain sum of square as r s s is always greater than or equal to 0. And if r square is close to 0, this indicates the poor fit of the model. Model is not good. And if r square close is close to 1, then this indicates the best fit of the model. For instance, if suppose for the model r square is equal to 0.95, this indicates that 95 percent of the variation in y is explained by the explanatory variables or you can say that the model is 95 percent good. Now, if r square is equal to say 0 0.35, then we say that or it indicates that the model is able to explain only 35 percent of the variation in y. So, you may consider it as not very good. So, basically r square indicates the adequacy of the fitted model. Now, there is a problem with r square whenever we add a variable r square always increases. So, another measure of goodness of fit of the model is proposed which is adjusted r square. And in adjusted r square in the numerator instead of taking the residual sum of squares we take mean residual sum of squares. So, we divide it by the corresponding degrees of freedoms. Similarly, in the denominator also we divide the total sum of squares by the corresponding degrees of freedoms. So, you can write r bar square equal to 1 minus n minus 1 upon n minus k 1 minus r square. So, if uh, adding a variable produces a too small reduction in 1 minus r square to compensate for the increase in n minus 1 upon n minus k. Actually, adjusted r square has two parts, this part and this part. So, whenever r square increases, you have negative sign here, but then you have negative sign here also, r bar square increases. But, there is one more part n minus 1 upon n minus k. So, whenever we increase k, it uh, leads to decrease in r bar square. So, if adding a variable produces a too small reduction in 1 minus r square or too small increase in r square to compensate for the increase in n minus 1 upon n minus k, then r bar square may decrease. When we introduce a variable, r square always increases, but r bar square may decrease. But there is a problem with r bar square, it may take negative values and negative values are difficult to interpret. You cannot interpret the negative values. For example, suppose you take k equal to 5 and n equal to 15 and r square is 0.15, then what is the value of r bar square? 1 minus 15 minus 1 upon 15 minus 5 into 1 minus 0.15 and ultimately you get minus 0 0.19 here, which is negative. Now, suppose you are interested in testing the significance of entire regression. So, for that purpose we use f test. So, you are interested in testing the hypothesis H naught such that beta 1 equal to beta 2, so on equal to beta r equal to 0. Then the f test statistic is f equal to E s s upon n k minus 1 upon R s s upon n minus k. And 
under H naught, this statistic follows an F distribution with k minus 1 and n minus k degrees of freedom. So, on the basis of this result, you can form a, the critical region for testing H naught. So, say suppose you take the level of significance as 0 0.05. then you obtain the tabulated value of f for corresponding to 5 percent level of significance. Now, if f calculated is greater than f tabulated, then we reject h naught. That is your model is significant. Otherwise, we accept H naught. Your model is not significant. You can also write F in this form. So, F equal to n minus k upon k minus 1 r square upon 1 minus r square. And then, if r square is 0, then F is equal to 0. And if r square is equal to 1, then because of this term in the denominator, F tends to infinity. So, f is a monotone increasing function of r square. For testing the significance of a single regression coefficient, we consider the hypothesis h naught beta i equal to beta i naught against h 1 beta i naught equal to beta i naught. Again, suppose c i i is the i th diagonal element of z transpose z inverse, then under h naught, we take the t statistic t equal to beta i hat minus beta i naught upon s under root c i i. And this follows a t distribution with n minus k degrees of freedoms. Again, we reject h naught at alpha level of significance if mod beta i hat minus beta i naught divided by s under root c i i is greater than t alpha n minus k. And if we take beta i naught equal to 0, then we get the hypothesis h naught beta i equal to 0 against the alternative h 1 beta i naught equal to 0. Then your test statistic becomes this t equal to beta i hat upon s under root c i i. Now, we consider some model selection criterion. Uh, the objective of defining these model selection criteria is to balance the strength of fit with the simplicity of the model. So, first we consider the Akaike information criterion. Notice that whenever we incorporate a variable in the model as input variable, it always decreases the error sum of square and it always increases r square, but then you have to estimate more parameters. So, the model becomes more complicated. So, somewhere you have to compromise between these two things. You also want to make your model as simple as possible. So, in defining all these information criteria, somewhere we penalize the complexity of the model. So, the first information criterion is AIC, a chi k information criterion, which is defined as AIC equal to n times log sigma hat square u. This is the maximum likelihood estimator of sigma square u plus n times log n minus k minus 1 upon n plus 2 k plus 4. So, this is how we define a chi k information criterion. And suppose there are g candidate models, then you fit all the g candidate models and ultimately you select model with minimum AIC. Then AIC has the problem of overfitting particularly in small samples. It includes more variables than desired. So, it has been modified as AI c c equal to a i c plus twice k plus 2 k plus 3 upon n minus k minus 3. So, this is the modified a i c. 
Then we consider Bayesian information criterion or Shevard's information criterion. Bic which is equal to n times log sigma hat square u plus n log n minus k minus 1 upon n plus k log n plus 4. Then another model selection criterion is Malo's CP which is equal to RSS k. RSS k is the residual sum of squares based on k variables including the intercept term also minus divided by sigma hat star square where sigma hat star square is the residual mean squared error based on all detecting variables. You calculate this residual mean square using all predicting variables whereas this residual sum of square is obtained just on the basis of k variables included in the model minus n plus 2k plus 2. So, this is your Malo's CP. So, you can use uh, these uh, model selection criterion practice suppose you have G candidate models then uh, for selecting a particular model you can use one of these model selection criterion. Now, in this example we have taken empty cars data set which is available in our software. The data set has 32 observations on 11 variables. Then the description of different variables is like this say MPG gives you miles per US gallon, S CYL gives you number of cylinders in the car, DISP gives you displacement, HP is gross horsepower and in this particular example we have taken HP as dependent variable or output variable. Then DRAT is real axle ratio, WT is weights in 1000 pounds, QSEC is 1 upon 4 mile time, VS is whether engine is V shaped or it is straight. For V shaped engine it is taken as 0, for the straight engine it is taken as 1. AM is transmission which is 0 for automatic and 1 for manual. Gear gives you the number of forward gears and CRB gives you number of carburetors. And in this example this is your output variable and uh, these three four variables are your input variables MPG, DRAT, WT and QSEC. So, the data is available in R and then we have used this command and ultimately we get this kind of output here and uh, this is some part of the data set. Of course, here I have not shown you the entire result. Uh, say first five observations on five variables of interest are these. You have different car models and then you have vi these variables which we have considered in this example and these are the observations. Just first five observations. So, as I shown you earlier to fit multiple regression we have used LM function of R and then we have obtained these results. So, this is the estimate of intercept term, this one is the estimate of regression coefficient corresponding to MPG, then the estimate of the regression coefficient corresponding to WT is 26.037. The estimate of the regression coefficient corresponding to DRAT is 4.819 and corresponding to QSEC it is minus 20.751. Corresponding standard errors are also given here 
and then it has also calculated the t values. So, these are the t values and uh, these are the p values. On the basis of p values, you observe that the intercept term is significant. So, suppose you are taking 5 percent table of significance means 0 0.05 is your level of significance. Then as long as this p value is less than 0 0.05, we consider the corresponding coefficient as significant. Now, this value is quite small, much smaller than 0 0.05, but if you consider this value, the regression coefficient corresponding to MPG has quite high p value. So, this is not significant. Again, the regression coefficient corresponding to WT, although it looks quite large here, 26, but it has large standard error also. So, the p value is around 0 0.064 or 0 0.065. So, it is larger than 0 0.05 and at 5 percent level of significance, the coefficient is considered as insignificant. So, just by looking at the regression coefficient, you cannot say that uh, the variable has a significant impact, although it looks quite large 26, but it is not significant. For DRAT also, it is not significant because p value is quite high. For QSEC, the regression coefficient is minus 20.751. So, it has uh, some kind of negative impact and the value is significant. It is the corresponding p value is quite small. So, on the intercept term and uh, QSEC, these two coefficients are significant, all other coefficients are not significant. Now, if we consider the entire model, then residual squared error is 32.25 on 27 degrees of freedoms and then multiple r square is 0 0.8073, which is quite high. So, your model is able to explain more than 80 percent of the variation in y. Adjusted r square is 0 0.7787 or around 0.78. This is the F statistic, which has 4 and 27 degrees of freedoms. And if you consider the p value for the entire regression, then the p value is quite small. So, the fit is quite significant. So, overall the performance of the model is quite good. But if you consider the individual variables, then some of the variables like MPG, WT and DRAT, these variables do not have significant impact on HP. So, in this lecture, we have discussed the di distributional properties of the least square estimators for parameters of the model say regression parameters as well as the disturbance term. We have also discussed analysis of variance table for the multiple linear regression model, which along with the measures like r square and adjusted r square can be used for judging the explanatory power of the model. And suppose you have more than one candidate models then for selecting a particular model, one can use one of the information criterion or more than one information criterions, such as a Akaike information criterion, Bayesian information criterion or Mallow's CP etcetera. We have also discussed an example which has been solved using 
our software. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hello, good morning everybody. I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management. We see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in 2000, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing. And after that, there has been exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem, countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, government should use these techniques in a very somber manner such that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learned can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in-depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantity finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantity finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I am and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck 
for the programs they will take. Thank you. Hello everybody, now uh, the discussion which I would try to um, make uh, talk to you is about the excitement which I always feel and I am sure you will also reciprocate as I proceed and when you do the course is in the area of multivariate statistical problems and multivariate statistical analysis. So, what we mean by multivariate? So, we know that statistics is a, is a subject where you ha have a lot of data, you try to analyze that using different type of techniques like estimation problem, MCMC techniques, then forecasting and the area of time series analysis and then try to basically find out the best forecasting tool which you have such that you are able to gain the maximum amount of information from a set of data. Now, in the recent past as we see that multivariate statistics has, has, has really increased in a, in, in a very exciting manner and if I trace back to history it has been going on slowly for the last about 70, 80 years, but now the time has come where it is being used in a very big way and the techniques which we all know, but which are being utilized with new vigor are in the area of say for example, canonical correlation technique, in the area of factor analysis, in the area of conjoint analysis, in the area of clustering analysis, in the area of multidimensional uh, scaling techniques, structural equation modeling, be it in the area of finance, be it in the area of engineering, be it in the area of social sciences, be it in the area of economics, such that you are able to gather the the information from the data in such a way that it really gives you some useful set of information. Now, in the recent um, past, there has been also an explosion of large and complex data sets, but added to that there has also been a, a commensurate increase in the computing and the statistical techniques. So, obviously, the question comes that if the statistical techniques are there for small, so called small data, not the big data, not the, the, the data which is of terabytes and, and, and so on and so forth, where you use different type of computers to state the data, the question obviously comes that are those statistical techniques really relevant when we use them in the big data sense. The question is they are not always relevant, they may not give you the best results. So, what we are seeing in years to come and, and I feel very excited about that is that how the new tools which we have already learned in statistics in multivariate statistical analysis are being redrawn, are being say for example, remodeled in such a way that they can be utilized along with the techniques of computing in a very nice manner that we are able to garner the information from big data very successfully and very nicely in such a way that they are able to portray a sense of information which we all long to have from big data, be it in say for example, medical sciences, be in the area of finance, be it in weather forecasting, be it in transportation, so on and so forth. So, obviously, it means that students, participants who are in a position with some brief mathematical background to take multivariate statistics and statistical tools as a subject in this program are assured are a very exciting future where they can use these tools to, to both gain the knowledge as well utilize them in a very best practical sense such that they are able to do some justice to the information which is given to them and get the best information from the data sets. I wish all the participants in this course the best of luck and I am sure they will also reciprocate the excitement which I have for these type of courses. Thank you.